pleasure to be here in any language. Uh, first of all, let me send greetings to the very impressive audience that has come together today. I see nearly 200 people here uh, from, I know, various parts of India, including, of course, the very distinguished faculty and students of Vishwabharata University, but also I know other institutions in India and even, I think, elsewhere. I'm sorry that because of the pandemic conditions, it's not practical for those of us in the UK to travel to India at the moment. But I have, of course, through family, known uh, Kolkata and the areas around it for many decades now. And I hope that in future, the gap between us can be uh, reduced uh, once again, particularly in pursuit of the always fascinating subject of China, India, and their relations with the world. I'd also like to thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor, who I know can't join us today because he's been called away, and uh, Dr. Niman Chansai, who is uh, very generously spoken in introduction and has um, uh, taken over the um, uh, chairmanship, if that's the phrase, or the uh, organization of this, this session. Thank you all for your time today. What I propose to do is to speak today uh, using a presentation for uh, perhaps about half an hour, 30, 35 minutes, and then leave about 15, 20 minutes for question and answers. I've been told by my honorable hosts that uh, you can just put a question in the chat function um, or the Q&A function, any one of those, we'll track it down and be able to answer some of those uh, as we uh, come to the second part of what I have to, uh, to, to say. But what I'd like to do really with today's talk is to give you not, I think, a comprehensive talk, because as you know, any comprehensive talk about a subject as big as modern China, even in the year 2021, would take us many hours or even days, and we have limited time. Instead, what I'd like to do is to give you um, a more concise framework, which I have found very helpful and have looked to develop to try and understand the many contradictions that I think shape the way that modern China exists uh, in the modern world. And of course, in this conversation, I'm sure particularly in Q&A, we will be thinking in particular about the relationship between uh, China and India and its neighbors. But of course, sitting as I am now in the United Kingdom, China's global relations are also, of course, a very important wider context for all of this. So I hope that that will provide the seeds for a productive conversation. Now, in doing that, um, I am going to, uh, first of all, hope that my share screen function is working successfully. I will give it a go. Yes, and let me just uh, start from the beginning. Great, fantastic. So China in 2021 is, a country, of course, which in many ways is making a great many decisions about itself just as much as it is making decisions about uh, its place in the world. And one way I have thought to think about the contrast is to look at these two very different pictures in some ways of the same man. Both of them, of course, portray uh, General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party and President of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. You're all, I think, expert enough to know plenty about him. But it's worth noting the background, because in some ways, the two background pictures, the lower one showing him at the World Economic Conference in Davos, that's actually from 2017, but he appeared again virtually, I think, this, uh, this year. And the top one showing the background of the Great Hall of the People in uh, Beijing, in other words, giving the 19th Party Congress speech shows the two roles that I think that Xi Jinping himself and the party that he leads um, are seeking to project. And it's worth remembering that in this 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, which was founded in July of, 20, of 1921, exactly 100 years ago, pretty much, in that context, it's worth remembering that the party has always had both a highly domestic element to its policy and a highly international one as well. And both of these have coexisted with each other, but not always comfortably. So thinking about Xi Jinping in Davos and Xi Jinping in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing provides a useful starting point, I think, to understand the contrasts in the China that we see at the beginning of this new decade of the 2020s. Now, what I have done is to try and develop a model that enables us in some ways to try and 
understand the different elements that can be brought together in understanding contemporary China. It's what I've called the China DNA model. And at some level, this is obviously just because DNA is a metaphor or a shorthand that we all use when we want to talk about the basic elements of something. We have all let that element of genetics, I think, um, shape our language over many decades now. But there's a particular reason that I use it, which is that it came to me as I was thinking about the factors that make contemporary China so distinctive that the initials for those factors were also, you may realize, the initials of the four chemicals, the nucleotides, as they're called, that make up actual DNA, the chemical that is the basis of life. They also have the initials A, C, G, T. And rather like DNA in the construction of life, I think that these four elements in shaping of modern China also make up much more than the sum of their parts. In other words, coming together, they do much more than any one individual element might suggest. And to be clear, I put it here on the slide, but just to explain uh, a little further, the four factors that I think make up China's DNA, at least in this model, the A factor, authoritarianism, means that essentially China, I mean, my, in my opinion, was never really looking towards democratizing in the liberal sense of that word, word anyway. It was never seeking to become a country like India or a country like the UK or a country like Japan. That wasn't the trajectory. But in recent years, China has become much more explicit about praising its own system as one that does not include popular democratic choice of leaders, but instead has other factors shaping it. And the Chinese themselves tend to use the idea that it is a meritocracy in which uh, performance at lower levels can rise up to the higher levels. But this of course also exists in a way that the state does not tend to talk about with an increasingly harsh use of coercion and state power. And that's why I think authoritarian rule is a reasonable description of the model of politics that China today is seeking to put forward. But there have been many states in history, as well as in the present day, that have that authoritarian tendency. That doesn't make China very distinctive on its own. So factor number two, the C factor, consumerism, is the one that I think gives a whole range of very distinctive elements to the China DNA model. Because if we think back to the Cold War, if we think back to the Soviet Union, one of the great failures really of the old Soviet model was its inability to find a lifestyle choice, an ability to create a socialist lifestyle that was simultaneously attractive to those who wanted uh, to improve their lives through the uh, markers that consumerism provides, whether it's um, uh, property, uh, pu personal public transport, uh, automobiles, um, vacations, all of the things that got to make the sociology of consumerism that shaped so much of the American Cold War vision of itself in the uh, 1950s to 1980s. Now, of course, China has its own very distinctive consumerist model. Then we need to turn to the G factor, the third one. And that's one that, again, was always there, but has really become much more prominent in the last five to 10 years. And that is China's model of globalization or global ambition, as you might put it. The idea that China will become deeply embedded in the world's international organizations, not just the United Nations, but the World Trade Organization and a whole variety of regional partnerships as well, particularly to do with trade. But this also has to do with a Chinese globalization and setting standards in everything from 5G, to telecoms, to uh, international norms on the internet, China has made it clear in recent years that it intends to be at the forefront of shaping and leading those sorts of developments. China is no longer content to be a follower, but wants to be a shaper of that kind of framework of the globalization of the 2020s and beyond. And the final factor, the T factor, is the one that I think really, in a sense, changes the whole uh, stress of what China wants to do, because technology is really something that China has enabled it, uh, has used to enable it to break out of the previous frameworks of politics and society in which it was confined. Even 20 years ago, certainly 10, uh, even 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, 
I think it is fair to say that none of us would have been likely to say that China would be a major innovator in technology. But we've seen the combination of intellectual property capture, sometimes legal, sometimes not, um, investment of 2.4% of GDP in research and development, and the use both of huge economy of scale within the domestic China market and the development of national champions, uh, companies like Huawei, ZTE, and so forth, have enabled China to create one of the most dynamic tech ecologies anywhere in the world, a large part of it driven by the desires and actions of consumers within China itself. So the point is that all of these factors come together. The technology that I've mentioned enables China to become a very successful authoritarian state, but also a successful consumerist state, and also one that is successful in setting a model of globalization, particularly with products like 5G technology to the wider world. And yet also the authoritarianism and the consumerism come together to drive the uh, interest in technology. In other words, both of those factors are driven further by, uh, are, are a factor that drives further the technological innovation that China is so dependent on today. So that's what I mean by this DNA idea that all of these factors intertwine with each other, they recombine and they're creating a kind of society that I firmly believe has never in that form been seen before uh, in uh, human history, really. Today's China is, I think, typologically pretty much unique. Uh, if you'd like to see more of my ideas on this particular model, please do see the Journal of Foreign Affairs, which hopefully should be available online uh, for you through the university or elsewhere, uh, uh, the issue from January, February of just this year, a few months ago, where I talk about these ideas in uh, more detail. But let me go on and say what I think this China DNA model really means in the early 21st century. I think it combines with another set of factors that have not been sufficiently understood in the wider world. And here I'm talking about what you might call the sources of conduct. And I use this phrase, as, phrase um, deliberately because many of you who do Cold War history will know that George Kennan, the American diplomat, back in 1947, uh, published a very um, well-known piece in the journal Foreign Affairs, in fact, called The Sources of Soviet Conduct, in which he essentially set a sort of prediction for what was gonna happen in what we now think of as the long Cold War between the Americans and the Soviet Union. And so in that sense, thinking about the sources of uh, uh, Chinese uh, conduct in that sense in the 2020s, also draw on a whole variety of much longer range factors. And while we could include many in this list, I want just to flag up four here, because I think along with the DNA factors, these are important elements that tend to be underestimated, although not I'm sure underestimated in the Chinese studies department at Vishwa Bharati, which I know has thought about these things over many years. The first is modern history. I think it's fair to say that compared to many other countries, China is more conscious of its own modern history and more sensitive about it than perhaps any other major power. Uh, more so, I think, in many ways than, than India, in fact. So I'm talking here about the sensitivities of, say, the opium wars of the mid 19th century, when uh, British and French warships invading, occupying parts of China's coast, taking the island of Hong Kong, and then selling opium into the mainland of China, opium, which was often, of course, grown and sold from uh, Bengal. Um, these are stories that are still very well remembered. They are talked to every Chinese school child and they inevitably shape and frame the way in which uh, the Chinese talk to many foreigners in general and uh, many Western foreigners in general and the British in uh, particular during uh, the last few years and decades. Other stories, perhaps less well known in the Chinese context, but well worth noting, include the Second World War. Uh, again, it's often forgotten that uh, China what fought as an ally alongside the uh, British, the uh, Americans, and then ultimately for a couple of weeks, the Soviet Union in Asia in World War II. Uh, many, of course, of those Chinese troops were actually stationed uh, on Indian soil during that time and then brought back into the second Burma campaign in 1944. Again, these are stories that have been revived and remembered in many ways in China but are not well remembered in the Western world. Uh, China's role is what I, one book I've called the forgotten ally 
of World War II still rankles in China. Although, of course, China's Communist Party has itself tended to forget or at least uh, underplay the fact that it was China's nationalist government under the previous leader, Chiang Kai-shek, before the communist victory, who actually did most of the leading in China during that period. And that has created a certain sort of um, historical difficulty for the Communist Party. Nonetheless, modern history remains a very important framing factor in the way that the Chinese uh, think about their own role uh, at home and in the world. The second factor is the one that I think is probably best known, but it's worth reminding ourselves of, which is the continuing importance of economic legitimacy in the shaping of uh, the Chinese Communist Party's rule. Essentially, ever since the 1970s, by growing the economy, putting forward economically liberal policies, along with very harsh um, political policies, China has managed to improve lifestyles, increase overall um, uh, increase overall national income, while of course also growing inequality across China uh, as well. But the overall growth in living standards has certainly been one important factor in terms of shaping uh, China's um, sense of its own uh, part, ruling party's right to continue ruling. Um, and that is, of course, in some ways in lieu of having national elections or any of the uh, paraphernalia of uh, liberal democratic societies. The third factor, which again is sort of known but often not much analyzed, is what I call traditional thought. In other words, there's been a real return to China's traditional philosophical um, history. The thinking of Confucius being the most uh, famous and perhaps important example, but by no means the only one that shapes the Chinese um, ruling classes of today. No, nonetheless, plenty of Chinese, um, sorry, I think someone's got their microphone on. If you want to just whip that on to, to mute, that would be great. Um, Chinese traditional thinking has been an important part of uh, the longer statecraft of China over many centuries and indeed uh, millennia, but it was rather downplayed in the early 20th century when there was a rapid reaction against Confucianism, particularly from Mao Zedong and other top communist leaders during that, uh, that time. Nonetheless, in recent years, certainly in the last 30 or 40 years, there has been a new interest in turning towards China's own traditional wisdom, as Xi Jinping and other leaders call it, and many of the norms of Confucianism, including hierarchy, the idea of mutual obligation, uh, and a sense often of kind of collective good, uh, have made their way into the uh, thinking of today's ruling party, even though in some ways it seems very anomalous to talk about a Confucian influenced communist party. That is nonetheless what China has today. And the fourth factor, and one that should be obvious because of the name of the party, but nonetheless is often really underestimated, not least because the Chinese overseas don't tend to talk about it very much. And that is Marxism Leninism. But there's no secret about this. China's communist party has always been a Marxist Leninist party. And today, its major theoretical journals like Chiu Shi, uh, Seeking Truth, continue to talk in detail about the importance of a whole variety of classically Marxist terms, including the idea of Maodun or contradiction, the idea of Dozhang, uh, struggle, uh, and so forth, as important ways of understanding how China sees itself in the world. The one major Marxist um, framework that is very underplayed in China today, and which is not talked about in those terms in the way that it would have been 50 or 60 years ago, is class, class conflict in particular, very much a feature of Chairman Mao's period in power, culminating with the disastrous cultural revolution of the 1960s and 1970s. But nonetheless, uh, in today's China, particularly since the three representations policy of former President Jiang Zemin uh, implemented in the early 2000s, since then, Class warfare and the turmoil and struggle that comes with it has not been an acceptable part of the public discussion of the party's Marxism. But this doesn't mean that many other aspects of Marxism are not discussed in great detail. So it's the second of my grids there, as I say, first of all, the four factors, authoritarianism, consumerism, globalization, technology, that give us the framework for where China sits today and where it's gonna go. And fourth, uh, second, these four factors as to where it's come from and how those shape 
the way that China thinks about itself in the present. Let's talk though, beyond those frameworks for a little bit about some of the specifics that I think are shaping China in 2021 and would hugely shape the way that it looks to operate in the next decade and more. First of all is the drive towards centralization by Xi Jinping. And I think it's no secret or any particular, uh, you know, particularly uh, unusual insight to say that Xi Jinping is now widely regarded as the most centralizing of China's leaders for um, a generation, if not more, uh, certainly more, more so than anyone since Mao Zedong. Uh, this could be seen in particular institutions such as Central Military Commission, uh, the heart basically of military control in China, very, very important over a huge range of armed forces. And Xi Jinping moved fast to make sure that he uh, maintained the chairmanship and the control in practice of that particular commission. He's also sought over the last decade and continues to use the message of anti-corruption as a powerful way of defining himself. And certainly there is opinion poll evidence that of many things that Xi Jinping has associated with personally, the anti-corruption campaigns of the last uh, 10 years have been part of that. And Xu uh, you know, one of the former senior military leaders who was purged very early on during those anti-corruption campaigns was a very public example of how Xi wanted to associate that with his um, current uh, uh, self-definition. You can see it in a different form in the last few days and weeks when, for instance, a crackdown on the big capitalist um, tech companies in China, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and so forth, have also showed that there is this strong sense that today's private sector is now becoming a target for the way in which the Chinese Communist Party wants both to bring them down to size and to continue to give the idea to the general public in China that vested interests are very much the target of the party leadership and big business in China can certainly be part of those vested interests. Okay, so another factor, which I think you know, is increasingly powerful and visible in terms of shaping the agenda of today's party is an ever growing sense of nationalism. At home, social media is one of the factors that uh, multiplies the sense that China has found its moment. The idea of the Chinese dream, very much pushed by the leadership, but shared widely within the population. The idea that China has been too, has had to spend too long uh, concealing its kind of true strength and power. And that now with the second biggest economy in the world, with this sort of huge international influence, it's time for China to take that bigger role um, overseas. Uh, sorry, not so, uh, at home and overseas and pro projecting the idea of, of nationalism in itself. There was a huge amount of discussion just the last few days, for instance, about whether China would top the medals table at the Olympics in Tokyo. In practice, uh, they just came second, but nonetheless, the nationalism around that sporting achievement was very visible in China itself on social media, where even the very uh, talented winners of silver medals were sometimes given a hard time on social media because it was alleged that they had let China down somehow by not getting gold. So very intense atmosphere around those sorts of national agendas. Nonetheless, China's domestic role cannot exist without, of course, a rethinking of its own geopolitical role. And there are many parts of China's international strategy, but I think that its role to become a leading power in the Asia Pacific region is one of the areas that should be understood as a core sense of its top priorities. Um, more broadly, China, I think, is looking for in, uh, influence in the wider world um, as well. Um, and that influence can come in many forms, but I would say that economics is one important part of it. Investment, finance, the capacity of China to use its famous Belt and Road Initiative to roll out investment and loans and influence all across South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, East Africa and beyond, even to Latin America. These are signs of a growing Chinese sense that it has a wider mission that it goes well beyond simply the maintenance of its state within its own borders, which was the case even perhaps 20 years or so ago. So that influence, of course, is economic, but not just economic, military influence, cultural influence. All of these areas are now growing fast as well. And they all go to make up a factor which China itself tracks in a pretty intense kind of way, the idea of Zonghe Guoli, comprehensive 
national power, an index uh, very much kind of uh, revised and looked at in China on a year by year basis as to which countries in the world essentially have that comprehensive ability to project power across the fields of economics, the military, culture, geopolitics, and so forth. The United States still, for the moment, top of that tree, but China's hope is very much that as it thinks the US is declining, so in return, China is going to uh, exceed and across all of those, uh, those areas. And that's very much part of the wider plan. But just because that's China's plan doesn't mean that everything will necessarily go to plan, not even the five-year plan, which has been declared uh, just a, a few months ago, earlier this year in 2021. So a reminder of ourselves in the year 2021 of where the pressure points, the pinch points, the opportunities, but also the risks come for today's China. First of all, worth remembering the urban pressures that really have done a huge amount to uh, put pressure on China's policy directions. Migrant labor internally within China still providing a major uh, problem because something like 100 to 200 million of China's population are migrant laborers away from their hometowns, away from their home villages. Under China's resident permit system, the so-called Hukou system, they're not, even though they're free to move, they don't carry all of their welfare and other rights with them as they move from their hometowns. So there are lots of people who can't bring up children, who don't have full health and welfare rights. And China still feels nervous about loosening up the Hukou system, because if they did, then they think that they would get huge numbers of country dwellers simply exercising their choice to move to the big cities and creating mega cities without sufficient uh, infrastructure, health, pensions, and welfare provisions. Nonetheless, they know that people would move because income inequality continues to be a major debilitating factor in China today. Rule of thumb, perhaps, that um, there's three times the income in a typical city compared to the typical countryside in China. The other side, of course, is the rural pressures. Uh, China has been urbanizing perhaps faster than any other society on Earth, but still nearly half of its population, even by official statistics, live out in the countryside with very traditional scenes like this, um, we're still you know, very much part of the scene. And thinking about how the countryside gets what it also needs, also healthcare issues, pensions, welfare, and all of the things that large, fast growing countries need to think about, these are still very much at the center of the political debate in China. Pension provision across China is very weak compared to most uh, developed countries. But even by those standards, rural pension systems are underfunded compared to those in China's cities. So China's countryside, still huge, still a major uh, constituent, you might say, in the social contract of China, still throws up a whole variety of problems that have yet to be fully resolved or understood. That said, Chinese society is changing very fast. There are a whole variety of reasons why the China of Chairman Mao back in the 50s and 60s is just a very, very long distance from the way that China is today. In those days, it was the joy of the individual to uh, bury herself or himself in the collective, particularly, say, as a young red guard uh, gathering in the center of, uh, of, uh, of Beijing to worship uh, uh, Chairman Mao, uh, worship Chairman Mao um, as he led a kind of gathering of millions of red guards in uh, the Cultural Revolution. That sort of world clearly doesn't exist anymore. While Xi Jinping, the current leader, certainly has a strong sense of his own personality, which is being heavily promoted officially, the kind of mass mobilization of the youth that was typical of Mao's China uh, is very much not the agenda of today's China. Instead, the youth are encouraged in many ways to seek their own consumerist, individualistic lifestyle, as long as it's not political. Here's a snap from an early uh, singing contest show on television, Chao Yu, the Supergirl, uh, which was uh, uh, won by a young woman who went on to become a major Chinese pop star. This has created its own culture, which again, if you're keeping an eye on the news from China, you'll see that this week, one of the most prominent Chinese uh, singers, Chris Wu, uh, has been arrested on allegations, very serious allegations. Um, we don't know if they're true or not, so we you know, keep them out of discussion, but just to say it has been reported, it's been arrested. And there is a wider um, discussion in China at the moment, certainly led by the party, as to whether or not the pop star culture has led young people, 
men and women in China, teenagers and others, spend too much think time thinking about celebrity culture and not, about a much, as, not enough about wider social responsibility. So this wider sense of individualism is leading to some shaking of heads and real agonization in China's leadership circles. And one of the reasons that's possible is because of one of the other huge changes, China has more internet users than the entire size of the US population, many more in fact, something like half a billion. And uh, while the internet of course is heavily censored in China because of the so-called Great Firewall, it's still the case not on everything from social issues to celebrity culture. China has created this huge ecosystem through the um, tech possibilities that have emerged in China, that T factor again that I mentioned before, that simply didn't exist in the China of 20 or 25 years ago. And that creates both an opportunity for the party and the state to spread their own propaganda and a headache when they realize that actually spreading those kinds of ideas um, may lead people, as in the case of celebrity culture in China, to take up ideas that aren't necessarily very much favored by the party itself. So the internet is both an opportunity and a risk for the party, just as it's an opportunity and a risk for the wider population. Another issue that is now coming up fast on China, as for the rest of the world, including India, Britain and elsewhere, is environment, pollution and climate change. And scenes like this and the use of fossil fuels are still far too common in many, many parts of China, which remains uh, the world's biggest emitter of um, uh, 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 climate changing gases. So while we're expecting and we hope for forward movement at the COP26 uh, summit uh, in Glasgow, Scotland this uh, November, nonetheless, it is very clear that China has a whole variety of domestic reasons to deal with climate change issue, issues. Uh, the horrific flooding in Zhengzhou city in Henan province just a few weeks ago when many people tragically drowned uh, in the subway system uh, on the highways shows that China is by no means immune from the terrible changes that are coming because of climate change and it will have to um, mitigate them to deal with uh, what is becoming the major global problem at the moment, aside from the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic, we should add also, is going to change many things about China as the rest of the world. There'll be much more caution about border policy. And I think the relatively free and easy entry in and out of China, which was possible in some ways for business people for uh, decades, will I think be quite heavily cut back for COVID reasons. So, as we come to the end of the comments, so we can leave a bit of time for discussion and questions, let me give you two last sets of thoughts. The first one is the reasons that I think that China's rise, its gain in momentum, has some factors that have been, I think, uh, you know, genuinely founded on objective reality. And the ones that China tends to bring up, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily always wrong, are the followings, the following. First of all, poverty reduction. With a per capita GDP of US 10,000 10, US dollars uh, per year on average, China has done a great deal over the last 40 years to come from desperate poverty to being a per capita middle income country. Now, many of the people living in the countryside still have much lower average incomes, and people living in China's cities have much higher incomes, but nonetheless, overall, its economic performance has much that deserves praise and attention. The second factor, is China's genuine innovation in technology and stress on education. And China, I think, is seen increasingly as a science superpower in areas like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, quantum computing, biotech, and so forth. The third fact is the Belt and Road Initiative. This is not popular in India for obvious reasons. I know you're all aware of that. But in many other parts of the global south, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, Latin America, Middle East, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the growth in Chinese loans has in many cases been productive in terms of building infrastructure. And to go to the fourth factor there, the health silk road as it's called, involves the vaccine rollout in the global south. This is still a bit in the scales. Um, it's fair to say that China's um, anti-vax, uh, sorry, anti-COVID vaccines have not been as effective as some of the Western derived ones, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. But at the same time, they have also done a certain amount, a significant amount, to hold back the disease in some parts of the world where they've been shipped. So the question is whether you should compare them with the Western vaccines, in which case for the moment, they don't measure up as well, or whether you should compare them with places that have no vaccines at all. And that, 
as India you know, knows from its own experience, as the UK knows from its own experience, the experience of being a country that has no vaccine protection is a much more frightening one, even than being in a country which has vaccines that are okay, but maybe not as good as the very best. And that's the position I think that China's vaccine rollout is in right now. It may well improve in a year or two from now. We'll see. The fifth issue is the environmental role. Both COP15 uh, to do with species protection and COP26 on climate change coming up this year, Kunming, then in Glasgow, uh, are going to be important moments to see how far China is able to lead on these issues. China has deliberately said that it wants to take global leadership in a whole variety of areas. This will be part of the proof. But so far, um, I think we can generally say that China is not behaving any better than any other major polluter. But at the moment, it's not necessarily behaving massively worse either. Nonetheless, we need China to do an awful lot better because it is emitting so much. And that's just a scientific reality, I think it's fair to, uh, fair to say. And the final one of the factors that I think you know, gives China leverage in the wider world is the greater role of the United Nations. Second biggest pair of dues to the UN has a significant role in peacekeeping and other um, areas. So there's a possibility for global citizenship by China in important areas. So those are all plus factors we have to bear in mind. However, I am going to have to end with some cautionary notes, and I think it's only fair to do so. China has slipped in public opinion around the world, mostly in the Western world, but not just in the Western world, in India also and other places, because of what it's been doing in the last year or more. The Hong Kong national security law uh, can be debated, but I think there's little argument that it has constrained freedoms of media, of public discussion, of uh, peaceful demonstration that existed prior to uh, its passing in July 2020 and don't now exist. Second, in Xinjiang, the Western uh, territory of China, there are still many questions about the re-education camps that have been set up there in which coerced uh, holding of many, many millions, uh, many, many thousands, possibly up to a million Uyghurs. We don't know the exact figures because there's no outside access to those camps. This is something that has clearly done China's image a great deal of harm on the human rights front in the last uh, year. And China is very aware of that because of course it's pushing back with some pretty angry language about this question. The third factor is COVID-19 transparency. Again, there are huge disputes between the Western world, China and the rest of the world on the question of how much information China has and whether or not it's releasing it and whether it should be done through the World Health Organization. China is very angry again, says that it's done everything it can and says the world is um, you know, giving it a hard time for no reason. Many other countries in the rest of the world push uh, to want to know more. Fourth factor there is the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, a phrase that actually comes from a Chinese movie, Jan Lang. Although um, these days, many Chinese bureaucrats don't like to use the, uh, the term. So it's moved from being one that China itself endorsed to one that China now wants to step back from. But the idea that instead of engaging in what you might call sort of um, persuasive diplomacy, China will instead tell its story around the world by basically telling people and expecting them essentially to say, uh, we agree with you. Uh, there's not much room for discussion in uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. And there's still debates in China itself about how effective this is. Although for the moment, it seems that it is the preferred direction of travel. And so far that's doing you know, a certain amount uh, to uh, eat away at China's international diplomatic achievements and chipping away at them. And the final factor, but I think it's the one that over, over, over arches the rest of them is the authoritarian strand, the A factor I mentioned at the beginning in China's DNA has become stronger in the last five to 10 years. And I don't think many analysts would dispute this particular factor. The rule has become more centralized, rule has become less tolerant in China of other viewpoints. Whether this is sustainable or desirable over the long term, in the end is gonna be one of the great debates within China itself, but it is one of the reasons why societies which have more free access to information and debate find it difficult to get behind many of the positive factors I've mentioned on the Chinese side, because they're still not quite sure what it is that China intends to do with its greater international status. In the end, that will be a decision for China. China has many more opportunities on its doorstep than it's had perhaps in a century or more. It will be up to the rest of the world, of course, to engage with China, but it will also be up to China to decide realistically and responsibly how far it is able to present an image of itself to the rest of the world, 
which will not just be about people doing what China says because they have to, but because they want to. The soft power dilemma that China is still grappling with and it is not yet at this moment solved. So if we're talking about what comes next for China in 2021 and beyond, that remains one of the biggest problems. And unlike some of the other issues we've talked about, not one that China has yet got a clear pathway to resolving. So I'll leave those comments there and I'm running a little bit over time, but if our host permit, we could spend 10 minutes or so with a little bit of Q&A. Uh, thank you all very much for joining me today. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Mita, for your wonderful deliberation. Uh, you have painted a very wonderful picture on where China stands today and the factors, the four factors that you have pointed out and the <clears throat> source from where it comes with, uh, you also uh, you also mentioned about the domestic issues, some of the issues which with, with which China is now uh, trying to find a solution on the urban and rural pressure that is being built up. Uh, moreover, you have also clearly pointed out about the influence regarding economic, cultural, military, some kind of assertiveness also we have seen in China's stand, especially after the uh, after this COVID-19, uh, this point started. So uh, so let me now uh, serve with your permission. Can I go to the chat box? So uh, by all means, yeah. by all means. Yeah, fine. So, uh, so some of the comments, uh, yeah. Uh, so one of the, so let me see the chat box. Mm, I will try uh, to see it. Uh, now the first question, sir, is what effect be on China in terms of emerging as science superpower, high-tech innovation center, particularly after recent crackdown on Chinese tech giants? Thanks very much. An excellent question, if I may say so. I would say that China right now on this question of science and development and its global role, is in the middle of what uh, actually uh, China's Marxists would call a maldun, a contradiction, because there are two opposing factors and it's not clear yet which way they're gonna go. On the one hand, what you might call the positive factor, I think it is positive, is China's huge spending as a proportion of GDP on research and development, 2.4%, which is a very, very large proportion of the, of the total. And still it's interest in internationalization. It still sends some of its very best students around the world to, to learn and study um, overseas. But there's also a more worrying trend, which is that at home, some of the uh, effects of that investment are not being given full reign possibility to operate. So for instance, a great deal of the, um, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the innovation goes into, as you've said, the big tech companies. And those are now being cracked down on in a big way. Uh, I think there's a worry on the party side that they're becoming too big, that companies like Tencent and Alibaba are almost empires in their own right, and they have to be broken up uh, by anti-monopoly provisions. But the problem is it's not entirely clear what's going to replace them and how that uh, ecology is going to allow the level of innovation that still exists um, at, the, uh, at the moment. It also provides another element of unpredictability in the system. We think about actually a related issue just last week when China's party announced that, you know, pretty much overnight, that China's huge private tutoring sector, which you know, operates in the private sector, would be shut down or rather forced to work on a non-profit basis. So essentially from a profit making point of view, shut down. Now you might argue this is a good thing because China's children are being forced to do too much extra homework and it's you know, destroying their, their kind of mental health and private lives. That, that's, that's fine. The problem was that this involved a very innovative sector of society, a lot of tech involved, a lot of investment involved, that was basically made worthless overnight. And that, of course, we creates a sort of predictability problem. If investors, if private tech companies, if scientists want to go into areas which they, they, they think may have some kind of long-term benefit to them in terms of investment and shareholding, but still remain uncertain about maybe, just maybe the system very unpredictably will turn on them, that will tend to constrain innovation because people don't tend to innovate in ecologies where they feel afraid that maybe everything will change tomorrow. So I think that's a key uh, difficulty. And if you want my short-term prediction, that's what's gonna happen. I think actually, I have to say in the short term, by which I mean the next two, three years, I think the party is gonna go for political control rather than 
uh, opening the markets to the widest range of investment possible. It's more important for them right now to show that the party controls everything and that people have to obey that precept than it is to worry too much about IPOs on the New York markets for the, the, tech, uh, uh, the tech sector. It's a calculated risk. Whether it's a correct one, we will see. But that's my bet as to what the risk is for the next, or their choices for the next two or three years. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So next question is uh, your opinion on socialism with Chinese characteristics mm. or individualism in new era, especially a man like Xi Jinping declaring himself as president for life. Which one is more favorable for China's future course of development? Socialism with Chinese characteristics or individualism in new era? Well, of course, China's leaders would argue that there is no um, contradiction between these areas and that the, the fullest expression of socialist fulfillment should be the ability to express your, 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 yourself. Just on the point of correction, it's worth technical correction, but it's important. The, Xi Jinping has not declared himself leader for life. He may well become that, we will see. What he has done or what he's had done on his behalf is to change China's constitution to mean that there are no term limits on the presidency. China. And I think most people expect that in the next year or so, in 2022, he will go for a third term, which is unprecedented in the modern era of, of president. But that is different because it exists within the structures of the party from simply getting up and going on TV and saying that he's the president for life, uh, which is, is, is not what he's, uh, he's done. And the reason that's important is it says something about the importance, even now remembering that even with one really very, very powerful leader, Xi Jinping, the party is still a really important structure. It honeycombs all the way through Chinese society. And although you have to understand Xi Jinping to understand today's China, you also have to understand the Chinese Communist Party as a structure in itself. So let me get to the part of the question about which is better for India. I think the actual honest answer to your question is the best thing that India could do is to be the best sort of India that it can be, in other words, one that continues to grow its own economy, that provides opportunities for its uh, younger people, that develops its service industries in a way that the world has actually looked at with, with great uh, attraction, and also, of course, encourages places like Vishwabharati, for instance, in other words, places for free inquiry, free thinking, the ability to debate difficult questions, something which actually is quite tough to do in many Chinese campuses these days. So India has a real advantage there. It mustn't lose that. I say that because I think that not much that China or India do to themselves is going to have a direct influence on the other. In other words, China is not going to look at India's system and say, we're going to do that. But likewise, even despite you know, occasional you know, ruminations from some Indian business leaders or others that we should be more like China, I don't think people actually mean that. And I don't think actually it'd be possible unless you can imagine the kind of top-down cellular organization that comes from a hundred years of Chinese revolutionary history. India's history is just completely different. So, you know, I, I don't think there's a kind of direct correlation between the, 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 the two. Finally on that, what is better for India? I think having a stable China that also is a kind of cooperative actor within the region is important. And for that reason, I think China find, uh, sorry, India finding friends and allies in the region, as well as maintaining a good relationship with China, both of these things are compatible with each other. So I would say what I often say to you know, British policymakers when they ask China specialists in the UK, what should the relationship be like? And I would say actually the same for India. It should be confident, it should be friendly, it should be frank. And all three of those factors are important at the same time. If you leave one out, you will have something missing. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. So another question is that, uh, how do you view the art of denial that China has mastered in and particularly employing it while violating human rights in Xinjiang and Hong Kong in its territorial aggression across the Indian side of LSE and establishing its hegemony in South China Sea or Taiwan? So, so, I, so it's a great question. I think one of the ways in which, what, I, what I'm going to do, because obviously at some level, these are all questions that are going to be hugely controversial between China and its neighbors and the world for a long time, is to try and give people a way to think about it. What I mean by that is this. In that question, there are at least two, possibly three different types of question built in. Some of them are questions about what happens within China's own borders. Some are about what China does across its borders. And some are about China's general behavior in the world. So with every criticism that we have of China and as I've said in my own talk, we should have areas where we look to learn from China and we should have areas where we are frank about criticizing China, both of those. In the areas where we criticize, 
Ask the question first, is it about something that's happening within China's own borders? That doesn't mean that we can't criticize it. For instance, I think that the Hong Kong security laws are, as I've said, cracking down on freedom of speech and media in that city. And it would be much better to go back to when there was much more free discussion, even just a year and a year and a half ago. So I'll be quite frank about that. But I would also say that that is a question that exists within China's own territory because Hong Kong is part of China. That's a different question from question type number two, which is, what about when China is operating outside its own borders or at them? So that's where the Galwan question comes in, the question of the border with India. That's very much about China's international behavior. It is a different type of question from the question about what, whether we should condemn what China does within its own borders. And the third and often the most difficult one is what happens in parts of the world where it's not just within China's borders, but the country concerned doesn't necessarily have a direct role. So neither Britain nor India is directly involved in the South China Sea, but many other countries, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia are. So the, the question comes up as to what is it that we're doing in terms of our conversations in the Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific region to provide a coordinated conversation with China about those sorts of issues. In other words, why is it that India should have a role in talking about the South China Sea? Now, I think actually there are good reasons to do so, but you have to be able to articulate what they, uh, what they are. So I would say that triad, the three part way of thinking about what are the kind of questions you're asking about China's behavior, then help us to work out what we think the answer should be. And as you gathered from my previous answers, my feeling is that when you have an answer, you should stick to it, you should be polite, you should be friendly, you should be courteous, but you should also be consistent. Thank you, thank you, sir. So another question is, uh... Can the international community be sure that Chinese leadership is not going to mention 100 years of humiliation every time as they do? Uh, no, you cannot be confident of that because they will mention the 100 years of humiliation every single time it comes up. By the way, I think the Chinese, I'm not obviously Chinese myself, but they might say, every time you mention human rights, we will mention the 100 years of humiliation. So it could be a sort of mutually enforcing thing that each side will basically give the other one a, uh, a, a, hard, uh, a hard time. I think what I indeed I've written uh, publicly before, and we're happy to do it again, um, that one of the areas where I think China is missing a trick is that by concentrating on the 100 years of humiliation, in other words, its own experience of uh, exploitation and being invaded, um, is that it risks getting caught up too much in the past instead of thinking about itself as a future looking uh, country. And I've you know, written that actually a comparison with India is quite interesting because you know, anyone in this conversation will know that India has many possibilities and many problems. You know, we could debate those another time. But actually it seems to me that overall compared to China, India doesn't spend a huge amount of its time in public discussion, you know, worrying about the British Empire and what happened 70 years ago and 100 years ago. Of course, it's remembered by historians and it should be remembered. But the idea that it defines India's foreign policy, particularly towards the West, I think is not true. That doesn't seem to be so much the case for China. China still finds it very, very necessary, as I said in my talk, to keep drawing on that aspect of modern history, which is very interesting to me as an analyst of modern history, but as a political tactic, I think I would gently say looking forward rather than back might be more helpful. So will the trade friction between China and America going to affect the rise of China? Um, I think the trade friction between America and China is probably more important in terms of, I think something that many other countries around the world are increasingly worried about, which is whether they have to choose between the two sides because China and America's trade with each other, while significant, isn't the most important factor for each country. They both have very large domestic economies and lots of other trade relationships. But think about countries, and it, to be honest, it doesn't matter that much for India either. I mean, India-China trade is significant, but it's not the defining factor for either country. But think about the countries of ASEAN. Think about Southeast Asia. Think about Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, you know, all the countries in that region. For pretty much every single one in that region, China is the single major trading partner. But also, for many of them, America continues to be the major security partner. And being in a situation where you're dependent on two countries which don't get on, one for your trade and one for your security, is a very difficult position to be in. So Southeast Asia, you know, over and all, I hear this from different experts all the time, is always putting forward the statement, don't make us choose. The statement is normally put to the Americans, 
because as you know, the Americans, despite their difficulties, tend to be more willing to hear critical comments. But it seems to me that in fact, it's also being directed at the Chinese. It's just that they don't explicitly put it to the Chinese because Chinese diplomacy, as we've been saying, has tended to be very reactive and often very angry when it seems that countries near them uh, are not saying the things that China wants them to, uh, to say. But the comment is meant for both sides. So one important is this question is right-wing people of India always dreaming of collapse of socialism of China. So what is your opinion about whether their dream will come true in the near future? Is the Indians dreaming of the collapse of the socialist China? Is it um, well, you'd have to ask the Indians who are uh, having those, uh, those dreams, but I, see, I think you could probably regard it in one of two almost exactly opposite ways. If you are a believer in socialism in the sense in which Chairman Mao meant socialism, then that socialism died in the 1980s, you know, about 40 years ago, when China essentially opened up its markets to the world, became a huge producer with a massive trade surplus, and introduced forms essentially of neoliberal economics into its, uh, into its socialist model. So that will be, you know, one answer, which is actually, it died a long time ago. The other one, which China itself, I think, its leaders would put forward, is the complete opposite, which is that they're saying we never stop being a socialist country. We've always been a socialist country, but socialism isn't supposed to be about poverty. Socialism is supposed to be about reducing a country to the kind of, you know, wreck of the, the lowest common denominator. Our increases over decades in living standards, in technology, in education, that's our socialism. And we have no embarrassment in saying that the next stage of socialism may take 100 or 200 years to emerge. Deng Xiaoping said something very similar. But in the meantime, if you look at where our economy and our, our society are, we are still on the path to socialism. It's other people who haven't managed to make that leap. So two different answers from two different sets of Chinese critics. But I think you can, you can go out there and hear both. So regarding this uh, pandemic, this COVID-19, many questions are there. So what is your opinion that is it People are accusing China that it has originated from China. So some of the students are asking that your opinion on this. The answer is I've got the faintest idea because I'm not a virologist, nor am I an international, um, you know, kind of bureaucrat who has access to these things. All I'd say, I'd say in all context, is that as much open information from all parties, including China, as possible is the only way we'll get to the bottom of, of, of any of this. So I think that everyone ought to be opening up all of their scientific information, their DNA sequencing, and all information possibly to internationally constituted uh, groups at, a, 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 at all times. But you know, in the end, this is one for the scientific community to engage with the major powers and make sure that we all get as much information as possible. So uh, autocratic China, we are all talking of China right. and autocratic states. So right. one question is, what is your opinion about the future of democracy in a world led by autocratic China? Well, I'm not sure autocratic is quite the right word. I've used the word authoritarian, which has a slightly different meaning. We're talking in authoritarian states about a system of operation, which allow a limited but notable space for certain other aspects of society to operate, although those aspects are becoming more and more um, constrained in China itself. Autocracy refers more to the rule of a single leader. Uh, Xi Jinping might count in those terms, but at the same time, as I've said before, he still has to operate within the party system. He doesn't have the you know, capacity to do absolutely anything uh, he wants. So uh, I'd, I'd be wary about mixing up those, those, those two terms. In terms of what it means for the world of, of democracies, um, as I say, and I'll say it again, I think the best thing that democracies can do around the world United Kingdom, India, United States, is to make sure that their own systems at home are robust. If we eat away at the things that make a democratic system, not just elections, but also uh, freedom of dissent, uh, ability to have free academic research, free newspapers that give a lively and oppositional set of views on all questions, these are not things that China can stop us doing. These are things we stop ourselves doing if we do them. So certainly in the UK at the, at the moment, there are many, many agonized debates about what Chinese influence uh, or Russian influence means in society. And I think all you know, those of us who look at these questions would say is that it's very important, India too, to make sure that outside actors are not uh, subverting society. But even more important is to make sure that your own society is robust and open and self-critical enough to be able to push back against anyone from outside trying to do anything to you. Right, sir. Sir, India has not joined the RCEP and also not yeah. the BRI. So yeah. will it will it hinder, will it hinder 
after China's dream of becoming a very strong and taking a decisive position in the international politics as India is yeah. out of the RCEP and also the BRI. My own general feeling about international organizations and frameworks, as long as they you know, have some, uh, you know, they're, they're not politically constraining to your own values, is that you should be in them. Uh, you know, it's better to be in the UN than out of the UN. It's better to be in the WTO than out of the WTO. Uh, India has traditionally, and you will all know this better than I do, has traditionally not been very enthusiastic over decades in joining international trading organizations because they basically all demand uh, lowering of tariff barriers and other non-tariff barriers uh, that make India's markets quite hard to penetrate for a load of, for a whole variety of, of actors. And I don't see that you know, changing very much. And regardless of who's in, in government, there have been different governments over, over decades, that lack of enthusiasm for entering international trade regimes remains quite constant. The trouble is, though, that uh, whether or not India wants to do that is one question. But China is there. China is very big. China is, as I've already pointed out, the major trading partner for, I think, every single country in the Asia Pacific region, even the ones with which it has a really bad relationship, like Australia. And therefore, RCEP is not going away. Uh, I think that, nonetheless, RCEP is it's a relatively low level of um, trade um, uh, agreement because the barriers it reduces are fairly minimal ones because China doesn't want to open its markets up too much um, either. I think some of the questions will come with whether some of the organizations like CPTPP, in which China is not currently involved, but it's expressed interest, which have much higher levels of everything from labor rights to uh, product standards, um, get any kind of major purchase in the Asia Pacific uh, region. And whether the UK is joining CPTPP from next year, which will be interesting as part of the post Brexit environment, uh, along with Japan already in there, of course. If India was part of that organization, that I think would transform the region but it would, it would uh, also involve India really having to change a whole variety of trading and tariff practices that I think that many you know, Indian businesses would feel deeply uncomfortable with. So in the end, like many of these things, it's really a question for India. Excellent. Sir, and on the Ta Taiwan issue, there are a number of questions I can- Sure. And just saying, we'll probably take about five minutes more if that's okay, yeah, and I'm probably gonna have to, to call off, but let's, let's try and get a couple on the more. Taiwan in, issue, sure. do you have any sure. kind of China-Taiwan issue? So do you feel that uh, China will be uh, in a humiliating position or will dominate Taiwan after some years or in the near course? I don't think either is likely. I think actually some version of the status quo, despite everything, is still going to be a more likely outcome in the next few years. Um, I think that the difficulties, strategic and geopolitical, of you know, launching a violent um, military assault on Taiwan are very great and the people in Beijing are quite aware of this. I think also the economic tools that Taiwan has with huge integrated supply chains with the mainland still remain from its point of view, the most effective way to coerce and pressure the island. So I certainly expect to see more economic pressure and coercion over the next two years. But I think people who are looking for a kind of major military confrontation, that, that isn't, I think, a terribly likely right. outcome for a whole variety of strategic reasons. Right, so another question, sir, many Buddhist scriptures, sir, they're in China, mm. both in Pali and in Sanskrit. Sure. So are they being published in English language, English translated? All these are being translated in English? That's one of the questions. Uh, I fear you'd have to ask someone who is a specialist in that particular uh, particular area. I will say, that, of course, the Buddhist tradition in China continues to be very, very strong uh, indeed. Uh, and the, the great translator, Kumrajiva, who uh, from Central Asia, originally from Kucha, mm -hmm. who translated, you know, thousands of texts into what became two million Chinese characters worth back in the fourth century CE. Those texts are still very much used in China today. So at a time when actually the number of Buddhists in India is relatively small, the number of course in China, a country where it was an imported religion, is now you know, in there many, many tens of, of millions, which shows you that uh, uh, as ever, China, when it wants to be, can be very good about adopting foreign ideas and making them very much uh, its own. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for you have taken the pain in answering a lot of uh, very informative questions and very good discussion we have. So uh, may I now request Professor Tara Prashad to make his final address? Of course. Thank you, Professor Rajiv Banerjee. It is now it is my pleasure and duty to propose a vote of thanks before 
my thanksgiving i would like to take two minutes of your time to tell a few words i have visited japan several times i have learned that japanese have three alphabets these are hiragana katakana and kanji hiragana is used for purely japanese words katakana is used for foreign words and kanji is basically chinese character then i asked my professor how many you know he replied few hundred only the beauty of this kanji is that they are usually derived from pictures for example a hand in japan is called in kanji possibly it is called te bird is called as tori entrance iriguchi this uchi or guchi means mouth and iri means entry point why i told all these this is only to tell how powerful kanji is now we have to come to the end of the session first of all i must offer my wholehearted thanks to professor rana meter for delivering an interesting and informative talk on china in 2021 for next among the audience who have a background in history and politics might have gone one step ahead in understanding professor meter's lecture nevertheless since the lecture was presented in simple and lucid terms we on the whole have followed to a considerable extent the summary of the lecture now let me thank the audience without whose online presence the lecture could not be successful i must thank dr nimai chand saha and his group who have organized this lecture i must thank professor obhijit banerji professor and head of the department of chinese p sabharati for coordinating and conducting this program from the beginning finally i must thank our honorable vice chancellor professor bidhu chakraborty for his inspiration in organizing this lecture in a series we are indebted to him for his invaluable support and guidance throughout lastly before closing i thank professor meter and cordially invite him to visit santiniketan whenever his time permits thank you all the lecture session is now closed thank you thank you all very much indeed it's been a pleasure I'd like to thank our sir dr professor banerji and all of the yes. audience today pleasure to be here thank you thank you professor meter for your thank kind you. patience and offering a valuable talk to us and we are eagerly waiting to find you in the campus in physical mode soon after the pandemic is over and when your time will allow yes sir okay i, I look so i thank, look forward to it yeah here yeah, it is good evening and there it is most likely good noon <laughs> good yes absolutely thank yeah. you very much bye bye so thank sir you. let me allow us to leave the meeting sure yeah yeah oh thank you